Yeah, hey everyone, thanks for attending the call. Uh, this is Victor, and uh, Brian, uh, as you know, Brian's one of our ROC duty officers here, emergency response specialist. Um, <clears throat> he's for the climate focal point, and Brian and I have been chatting a little bit, and one of the items we've come up with where we think there might be a, I don't know, a disconnect or maybe a, a need would be is in the area of um, making our field officers aware of what's going on uh, with regard to climate change, climate variability, and what tools are out there as far as helping you at the WFO or RFC or helping you assist partners in meeting needs. So as a backdrop, like uh, the email I sent about an hour ago, the President's Climate Action Plan, or PCAP, uh, which was, I think, rolled out, I think, middle of last year, last summer, contains a whole lot of you know, presidential actions or maybe perhaps combination of actions, executive orders, and orders, you know, cities, counties, states, federal agencies to, in essence, start factoring in climate change or climate variability into some of the things they do uh, with regard to planning. Um, the most important one, I think the one that might affect us, is the state has mitigation plans. Um, FEMA apparently is requiring all the states to include climate change in their state hazard mitigation plans, which they're required to update every two to five years. So a couple of weeks ago, Brian got a call. Um, as luck would have it, while I, while I was with David at the uh, Climate Prediction Applied Science Workshop in New Mexico, Brian got a call from FEMA Region 6 here in uh, Denton, Texas, asking for, hey, can you give us uh, some tools? Are there, any, are, there, are there any tools out there, any information out there uh, that deal with climate change that we can turn to or uh, have the states turn to for information? And from, in my opinion, perhaps one of the best things out there is indeed this U.S. Climate Resilience Toolkit, which David has been, I guess, a key producer, a key cog in making it happen uh, with the or through the Climate, NOAA Climate Office or C, Climate Program Office or CPO. So I guess uh, without further ado, I'll just turn, well, I'll turn over to David. We'll drive this thing. And David can speak. And um, I guess we'll hold off on questions perhaps maybe after David's done. And... Um, like I said, this, the, the goal here, or my intent here, is to basically make you aware of this tool that's out there for you to use internally or with your partners or to refer your partners to when they come to you with questions on, you know, climate variability, climate change, what does it mean for sea level rise, you know, various different uh, hazards or impacts. Any questions before we, from the field, before we get started? Okay. Nothing heard. So, David, uh, take it away. Thank you, Victor, and thank you, Brian. And again, sorry for the technical difficulties on my end. Um, so I'll speak to it, and, and you can drive, and I'll just say a, a few more words by way of table setting. And I'm, I, if I recall correctly, you guys were shooting for you know roughly 25 to 30 minute overview, and then allowing time for discussion and question and answer. Is that what I should shoot for? Yeah, we're going to need to definitely wrap it up by top of the hour because we have the. <laughs> the other briefing there at the... Oh, okay. Is, and I can try to keep it shorter if that's too much time. Yeah, we, uh, so go all, ahead. Yeah, all the weather service offices got a 2 p.m. Central Time hazard simplification briefing from uh, Louis over to headquarters. So, okay. yeah, 30, 35 minutes, David's good, then we can have Q&A. Okay, great. So, again, well, uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, for tuning in then. And... Um, as uh, Victor mentioned, um, I played a, a lead role on behalf of NOAA. Uh, the White House uh, Executive Office of the President asked uh, Dr. Sullivan um, if NOAA would be willing to play a leading role uh, in developing and hosting the U.S. Climate Resilience Toolkit. And um, uh, she said yes, and um, they, you know, I've been playing a role as program manager for NOAAClimate.gov. So they invited uh, uh, my team and I and, and other uh, key partners to um, to work together. And so we started what I call sort of a developmental sprint um, in the late winter, early spring time frame of last year and developed the toolkit over about a four to five month period and then published in November of 2014. So it's a brand new website online at toolkit.climate.gov. Since it is an interagency partnership, um, it's, uh, there's a neutral banner. It's not branded for any individual agency. Um, it's an interagency partnership. And I'll say a few more things about that and just sort of the nature of how this is, has been developing um, up to now. But when you first load the site, you'll notice, and um, 
Victor, if you'll kind of click the forward arrow in the rotator, you'll uh, or you can hit your refresh button on your browser. Um, you see, there's the little sort of dots, and then there's arrows pointing left and right. If you point the right arrow, um, yeah, and then you click on that, you'll see that in each time you reload the site, um, it uh, goes through a series of frames, which are identifying the five-step process, and so. The purpose of the Climate Resilience Toolkit is to provide tools and information and access to expertise to help people move into a planning process. And so um, each of these uh, slides, if you sort of, if you hit refresh or if you reload the, the page, it kind of cycles through and it highlights the five-step process. Um, and these are also highlighted in the Get Started section, so just to orient you to the front page, um, in the top, there's the navigation bar, which is called Get Started. There's a link, and it takes you into the Get Started section. Um, and then there are other sections called Taking Action Tools, Topics, and Expertise. And um, part of the point of the toolkit is to help people who have not yet begun planning uh, for adaptation or how to build resilience to climate-related extremes um, to move into a planning process. And it sort of the, this, uh, the content carousel here on the main page sort of walks you through the five steps of the planning process, and each one of those uh, highlighted in sort of orange or yellow is a prompt that moves you into the Get Started section with kind of a high-level checklist. And so down the right-hand side here on this main slate where it says identify the problem, determine vulnerabilities, investigate options, and so forth. Um, there's a link, but it's also sort of a summary overview of the five-step process, and we're going to have a look at that in just a second. Just below the content carousel, there is another carousel of videos that are highlighting how real-world people out there across the nation are building resilience in different bus in businesses and communities all across the country. And so we have over a dozen now, and again, if you hit the, uh, in the find out how people are building resilience, if you hit the left or right arrow there, you'll see that you can scroll to the left or to the right and um, identify, you know, that we have um, probably a dozen or more now videos introducing you to real world people who are grappling with different uh, weather and climate related challenges and environmental challenges. If you scroll down just a little bit more on this page, um, you'll see in the bottom center there is an overview video. Um, it runs about two minutes, and um, if you uh, if you were to click on that, it would bring up a letter box and it would start to play the video. And it runs for about two minutes, and it just takes the viewer by the hand and walks you through and orients you to what's on the site, what is its purpose, you know, uh, and what are the contents, what's the scope and the content. So I encourage everyone to kind of come back and watch that on your own. Watching a video over a webinar is not such a great experience, but um, uh, if you go back in, it runs only about two minutes, and it's just a quick orientation to what's there. And then in the bottom left is the Climate Explorer, and we're going to spend a little bit of time there in just a minute. It's an interactive geo browser that has sort of a Google Maps look and feel and it is a, offers a framework for inclusion where we've made available a number of um, climate stressors, maps that are showing climate-related stressors as well as people and assets impacted. And, and these are made available in conjunction with some of these taking action case studies that are highlighted in the videos above as well as the online stories that are linked to. Um, so if you scroll back up to the top of the page, uh, Victor, um, We'll, we'll start to move through the navigation menu and, uh, and explore the site more deeply. Um, and, but before we leave this page, I'll just call your attention to the top right. There are some additional links. There's about this page. There's contact information. There's a summary page that gives you sort of a high-level executive summary of funding opportunities that are out there for communities and businesses who are seeking f federal grants or foundation grant funds to either recover from a disaster or to build resilience to uh, some stressor they face, and then an FAQ about the site. Um, if you move into the Get Started section, so if you mouse over in the main menu where it says Get Started, um, you'll see that there's a mega menu that pops down, and there's sort of an overview about this section, and then the five steps. So if you could, uh, click on any one of these, maybe step one, identify the problem, for example, that moves you into the Get Started section. So Get Started is both a navigation prompt as well as a verbal prompt to encourage people to start to, to make a beginning. Um, 
And so what we're really trying to do here is to help people begin to orient to the types of uh, climate-related issues and stressors or impacts they either currently face or may face in the future. The contents of the toolkit are um, excerpted largely from the third U.S. National Climate Assessment, which is flagged down below in the, in the body. There's that sort of lift out box. And what each of these pages is doing, if you scroll down a little bit, it's just sort of helping to orient people with what are the different elements that goes into each step. And so, for example, here it's encouraging people to work within their community, whether they're in a business or they're in a municipality uh, or a particular watershed, you know, whatever is their community, to define the problem and to understand who's impacted, who has skin in the game, and that sort of thing. And so right here in this context, there's this gray shaded box, and it highlights a number of tools that are out there um, uh, and templates for, uh, for working with communities to, uh, to have dialogue and identify problems and issues. So um, uh, the, uh, the thing that we've tried to do throughout the site is to kind of embed uh, the information and the links into sort of a context that helps people understand um, what's available to them and, and, and how it can be used. So if you, if you look in the right-hand margin, so Victor, if you scroll up and look in the right-hand margin, you'll notice also that throughout the site, it's crosswalked. So um, when you come into any of the steps of the five-step process, in the right-hand margin below that list of buttons, you'll see there's the category Taking Action. And there are links to case studies in our Taking Action section that highlight someone out there who has been uh, grappling with or is at step number one. And so these are case studies highlighting other people who are at step number one, which is defining the problem. And then you'll also see down below that there are a number of tools available in the toolkit that are also relevant to step number one, defining the problem. And then there are links that take you specifically to that tools landing page. So a, a point then that I wanted to highlight is that in the navigational design of the toolkit, we wanted to take sort of a no wrong door approach so that you know, no matter which part of the site you come into, there's, uh, you'll see that it's crosswalked so that you can move laterally uh, through the site and find relevant information that you know, but has been given that, that context that I alluded to. So Victor, if you scroll up, um, to the top nav again, and we'll move into uh, another section of the toolkit. We'll move into the taking action section. Um, I should say, by the way, before we leave the, the five-step process, though, one of the things that we're doing now is we have begun uh, spinning up. Uh, we have a draft engagement model, and we're beginning to reach out to businesses and communities to work with them and begin moving them through this planning process. So for example, we have an engagement scheduled in May in Maine with um, folks from four different sectors in that state, and they're interested in, in uh, sort of moving through this planning process to build resilience for the state of Maine, for example. Um, and then we'll be uh, looking to engage with others to kind of highlight some of the tools that are available that might be relevant for them in their resilience planning. So if you scroll up to the top of the page and then move into the, um, can you go a little, there you go, into the taking action section. Um, you'll notice uh, in that section that's a library of dozens of case studies. These are real world case studies, uh, again, introducing you to people who are grappling with climate related issues and challenges. And if you mouse over where it says filter by topic, so as I said, we have dozens of these now, and so you can filter quickly according to topic and subtopic of interest. Um, and so you can also filter by the five-step process. So in the next one over to the right where it says filter by steps to resilience, and see so the number in the parentheses tells you here are how many case studies that we have relevant to that particular step in the five-step process. And so you can quickly subset and see which ones relate to that particular step. Or you can filter by region of the US. And so again, you can see which ones are relevant to which region. Um, if you click on um, a given topic of, or a given thumbnail or title, it'll launch 
Um, if you want to go ahead and filter, if there's a particular topic that you're interested in, it might have to do with, like, say, water resources. If you go down to ecosystem vulnerability slash water resources, and then you click there, you'll see that it will uh, you go ahead and click on that, and it should, um, yeah, go ahead and subset. And so these are ones that are related to water resources. And if you click on one at random, I don't know that it matters. Um, there's one feature. Yeah, the climate outlooks help water supply planning. So that's one. Okay, there you go. Then the water utility builds flood resilience. So here again, um, you'll see in the main body of the case study, there's a narrative. And it, it it's very short and kind of to the point, introducing you to a person or a team or an entity out there who's grappling with an issue, in this case having to do with water resource management. Um, and then it sort of uh, sort of tells the story of this person and the, the challenge that they face and the steps that they took and, and, and what was done. And you'll also notice, similar to in the five-step process uh, page, in the right-hand margin, we've also, again, we've crosswalked it. And so all of the case studies have that same approach where um, it's, it's relevance to which of the five steps in the five-step process, in this case, all the way to take action, which is step number five. What tools were used in this particular case study? There's the flood resilience tool, a guide for water and wastewater utilities. Uh, below that, what topics and subtopics in the toolkit does this relate to? And so those are all highlighted. In this case, it's a multifaceted story, so it relates to many topics and subtopics that are featured in the toolkit and then links out to additional resources. And so if you scroll down further, Victor, let's see if uh, this particular one was uh, connected to This is one of the rare ones. It's one of the newest case studies we've just uploaded. And so we don't have the, the, uh, the Climate Explorer featured, although there is a video there that's featured in some cases where we have a video um, that's relevant, We're, we also make that available. And I should say that these videos are also published in YouTube, so folks are free to take them and use them also in their own websites or in your own engagements if you, if you want to. Um, if you scroll back up, and then we'll follow the link out to the, um, if you click in the right-hand margin where it says the flood resilience, a basic guide for water and wastewater utilities. So you can jump laterally now from the taking action section. Now we've jumped sideways into the tools section, straight from the case study. And every tool in our tools compendium has a landing page like this. It, it's sort of a, a title graphic, a, the title and a short summary snippet of what the, what the tool's purpose is. And then down below in the main body, there's a narrative kind of highlighting what the tool its purpose is in cases where if it's a software tool or a visualization tool, it usually offers like a bulleted list of what's the functionality and the purpose of the tool and that sort of thing. And then again, similarly in the right-hand side, a very similar layout in terms of the crosswalking I mentioned. These are the topics and subtopics that this tool is relevant for. Uh, it lists all the case studies uh, in the Taking Action section that feature the use of this tool. Um, where online can this tool be found? The web address and, and the agency, the sponsoring agency's website is given. And in cases where the tool has uh, online training or tutorials available, uh, we offer a link out to there and then other a federal agency partners uh, who participate in that tool's uh, development are, are listed there. So just there all to, uh, to put things into context. And so if you go to the top of the page now and um, jump into the Tools section. So if you click where it says Tools in the main navigation, you'll see there's a similar layout in the Tools Compendium uh, where it presents. Uh, go ahead and click on that uh, or, or Browse Tools, either one. It'll take you into that section, and it'll show you a grid of all the tools that are available. And again, we now have uh, dozens of tools, but you can quickly filter and subset by a parent topic. These are the um, the five topics that are available currently in the toolkit, and again, showing you how many tools are, are linked to each of those categories. Or you can filter by tool functionality uh, to the right of that, which is a way to quickly subset according to um, what, whatever you may be interested in. Um, if you go into the Topics section, so if you look in the main navigation menu where it says Topics, go ahead and click on Topics. And this is kind of a... Um, almost like a table of contents. 
and it lists, and you can scroll down. I think it should also have the water, um, the water resources, yeah, down below there. So currently, there are five sections, five topics addressed in the toolkit. Um, and the first four, when we published in our initial deliverable in November, were uh, coastal flood risk, ecosystem vulnerability, food resilience, and uh, human health. And uh, just last month, we added water resources. And um, behind each one of these topic areas is an interagency team of experts. So the White House um, asked, for example, the Department of Agriculture to co-lead the development of the food resilience section. Um, Department of the Interior and USGS to co-lead ecosystem vulnerability, um, Centers for Disease Control and National Institutes of Health to co-lead uh, human health, NOAA led uh, coastal flood risk, and together with uh, USGS uh, co-led the water resources section. And so um, compri and behind each of these sections is then is a team of experts. And what we did to help us get started roughly this time last year actually, was we asked the teams to make a list of what are the key questions or challenges that you've been hearing people across the nation are grappling with. What are the types of questions they have and the issues they face? And then based on those questions and challenges, what are the key tools and resources and, uh, and case studies that you're aware of that are particularly relevant to that list you made and that gave us an opportunity to kind of <clears throat> bound and focus the toolkit uh, and gave us a, a, way, a, a starting point. So um, when we were starting, we, we were just overwhelmed by the universe of possibilities uh, of all the information that's out there. There's a tremendous number of websites and tools and resources that are out there. And so we needed a place to start, and that gave us a place to start. Um, and we used those theme teams as the sort of panel of science experts to vet and review all the materials that we published in their sections. And so that's why I was careful to characterize the toolkit as a quote-unquote initial deliverable, because as we go forward over time, we're fully expecting that the scope and the contents of it is going to rapidly expand, especially as we move beyond just our federal family of partners and to begin to grow and develop relationships sort of at a state and regional uh, level, working with state and local governments and, and, and tribal entities and communities to get additional information. Um, a couple of other topics that are forthcoming uh, focus on tribal communities, working with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, a section on uh, energy uh, and infrastructure, and another section on uh, supply chain risks and transportation. So those are things that are forthcoming in the future. And we also have a new theme team that we've just spun up that's going to be focusing on climate projections and how to integrate those into the Climate Explorer. I'd like to take a few moments now just to move into that. So if you could scroll up, Victor, and go into the Tools menu where it says uh, Climate Explorer. Go ahead and click on that. <clears throat> Um, this is a landing page that gives sort of a high-level overview about the Climate Explorer. And if you scroll down, it just it's just sort of a how-to, and it gives you screenshots showing you what it looks like and what the different functions are and the capabilities. So you can kind of open up a new tab if you wanted to play with the Explorer, or have the Explorer in one tab and this and the other. Go ahead and launch the Explorer. And when you do, um, <clears throat> you'll notice it opens the link in a new tab. <clears throat> Typically, when you're coming into the Explorer, uh, you're coming in through a case study. Most of the case studies in the toolkit refer to a particular location and have specific map layers preloaded. And so if you were looking at a case study that had to do with, say, coastal flooding in the aftermath of Superstorm Sandy in New Jersey, um, it, would, it would load the tools zoomed in to that location with the sea level rise uh, maps and uh, other relevant maps sort of preloaded. And so you're kind of coming in already having some context. In this case, we've just launched it from the landing page, and so it's in its more generic state. So you'll notice uh, in the upper left corner, uh, Victor, you can zoom in and out if you want to um, by clicking the plus and minus button. Um, in the bottom left corner, you can click on the imagery button, and that will switch you over from a street view to a satellite view. And um, in the top right corner of the browser, you'll see you've got sort of two options. You've got layers and historical data. 
And so in in the uh, in the layers where it says uh, coastal flood, okay, you clicked on historical data. That's fine. Either way, um, why don't we stay on layers for just a moment? And where it says coastal flood risk, click on that triangle, and we'll click on to say food resilience. And um, click on the link that says current drought, and we'll switch that on. And so. Um, what you'll see then is um, what we've done here in the Climate Explorer is we've built what I call sort of a framework for inclusion. None of the map layers that are accessible here are hosted by us. We're going out in real time and shaking hands with uh, web map services from around the federal government and bringing them in. So if you were to switch on, say, down below where it says people and assets impacted, you'll notice these are parsed into two categories of climate stressors people and assets impacted. So if you click on, for example, cropland down below, it'll switch on another map. And um, you can see where be below each title in the right-hand side, there's a little blue bar. And on the right-hand side, there's a handle. If you click on that beside where it says 100% and drag it to the left, you'll notice, if you, yeah, if you click and drag, you'll notice that you can change the transparency of the map layer. And so you can kind of go back and forth, and that allows you to visually correlate. And if you say, well, that's great, but the cropland doesn't make much sense to me, you can click on the little I button, and down below uh, the color bar will appear, some of the legend information, and then you can sort of scroll down to see, well, what do these colors mean, and you know, what do they correspond to. Um, and so if you switch off the cropland uh, map layer for a second, and then go up where it says historical data, on the, the top right, it will switch on the Global Historical Climatology Network stations, locations, each of those pinpoints. And in sort of the deepest red of a drought-stricken region, why don't you click on one of those pinheads in the map. And you'll see what it's going to do is it's going to switch on two data layers. Uh, it's going to switch, um, I mean, I'm sorry, two time series data from that particular station. It's showing you temperature and it's showing you precipitation. So specifically what this is showing you is, is kind of a, a running uh, observation of weather superimposed on 30 uh, on, the, on what is quote unquote climate normal for that location. So in the top trend graph, you're seeing daily high-low temperature values in blue superimposed on the 30-year normal range in green. And then down below, you're seeing the uh, year-long precipitation uh, uh, cumulative total uh, superimposed on what is normal. In that case, you can see they're operating in a deficit as compared to normal. And this is an interactive multigraph. So, if Victor, if you click and drag the x-axis, you should be able to click and drag on that to troll backwards and forwards through time. See if you can do that. Sometimes it takes a little second to find the, the spot. Um, it should be able to do that. And then um, you can also hold down your Shift key and click and drag, and then it allows you to zoom in and out. So holding down the Shift key allows you to sort of zoom in to uh, zoom out to see um, many decades or many years' time, or you can zoom in, in to see like a, a particular week of interest if you want to. I don't know if you're able to make that happen or not, Victor, where you're at. Um, so that's something that you can also play with on your own, and I encourage you to do that. So um, oh, you know, over time, as I mentioned, the, the Explorer being that sort of framework for inclusion, we're envisioning um, including uh, additional time series data, such as possibly adding stream flow data or other in situ data. And this is one of the things that we heard often in our listening sessions that we had with, uh, with different folks, is they wanted to be able to see a combination of, uh, of gridded data, such as the map that you're seeing. There you go. So you're, now you're zooming in and out over time. And so you can zoom out to see many years at a given time, or you can you know, scroll all the way backwards through time to see you know, all the way through the whole station's history. Um, you know, or you can zoom in to, to see a given week. 
and and people were saying, well, we we want to be able to see the big picture, what's happening on a national scale or on a regional scale, but we're also in particular interested in what's happening in our location, and to be able to see um, local data. And um, and so that's one of the things that attracted us to the Climate Explorer is um, it allows us to bring together both of those worlds in this uh, one interface. And it's an open source, so it's accessible on GitHub. And we're looking forward to maybe having some open innovation challenges aimed at evolving the Climate Explorer over time. And um, we're also going to be looking at adding some additional functionality, like allowing users to be able to define extreme thresholds that matter um, to them and to maybe quickly do tallies like how many times has an extreme high or an extreme low in, in these different uh, measurements happened, such as extreme high or low temp or precip uh, and that type of thing to begin to understand or maybe even to see trends of change over time. Are we over time moving towards more highs or more lows and that type of thing and what's the rate of change over time? So those are some ways that we're already starting to entertain evolving the Explorer as we move forward in time. Um, so uh, yep, you can close that. And, uh, and you can also turn on as many different stations as you want to. If you come back over, Victor, into the, um, in the other tab where it says Climate Explorer, I'm going to wrap up now with just a couple of other things. So if you scroll back up, to the top of the page. I just want to show you a couple more things. Under the um, expertise menu, one of the things that we heard, if you select on where it says uh, training courses, um, <clears throat> in listening sessions we also heard people say, you know, well, don't think that you're going to just publish information online and it's going to meet, you know, all our needs. We're, we're always going to have need to uh, be able to ask questions uh, of experts that are specific to our business or our location or our unique circumstance. And so we, we, we got to thinking about what are some different ways that we could begin to move in that direction. And so what you're seeing here is kind of a step in the direction. We definitely want to go much farther. Um, but we have a, a catalog of, uh, of courses offered here, initially focused on sort of a climate science 101 and coastal flood risk. But as we go forward, we're going to be linking to more and more courses that are offered to help people sort of understand topics and understand tools and their use. If you scroll up, Victor, you'll see that you have a similar uh, filter function. Uh, you can filter the courses by, again, by the topics, uh, the categories rather that are there. You can filter by the type of training um, and by difficulty scale. And uh, a next step in evolution in this section is we want to work with those theme teams that I mentioned earlier to begin to knit courses together into very purposeful learning progressions that would be able to move someone from a point of, I don't really understand how climate variability and change affect food production or food distribution, all the way to, I know very well how they affect this topic I care about, and, and I know where and how to find and use tools that help me in my job. And so we're going to be uh, evolving this section of the toolkit uh, in the, over the next year or two in that direction. Um, if you also mouse over the expertise menu item, one other area I'll call your attention to where it says find experts. Um, it also occurred to us that people would want to be able to identify experts in their region or in near their location who might be able to answer questions. And so in the left-hand side, if you click those little plus buttons, you can expand beside NOAA and by USDA. So the default is to show the U.S. climatologists' offices. But you can click on another uh, layer, for example, the RESAs or the regional climate centers uh, or what have you, and see their area of coverage. Um, and uh, go ahead and click on one. doesn't matter. And then if you click on a given location that's pinpointed on the map, you'll see what happens is a, um, a menu, will, I mean a, a, a window will appear. And it identifies the location you've selected. There's a link to its website. There's a sentence or two kind of highlighting what's the, uh, the focus for that particular location and what areas does it serve, what states does it serve. And so if you need someone to 
um, to do a bit of hand holding or to bounce a question off of or perhaps invite to an engagement that you have locally, this would be a way to uh, to locate experts near you who uh, who might be able to engage. Um, the last thing I'll show, and then we'll open it up for discussion, is uh, in the search field. Uh, Victor, if you type in, uh, I think I mentioned, say, food production. So if you type in food production in the search window, you'll notice it quickly starts to autofill, first of all, to kind of, and you can uh, select. But if you go ahead and type that in and, and then hit return, you'll get a result set. And um, you'll see where it says un underneath that field where it says filter, and then the right-hand one, is the, the, the default is to show toolkit content first. But if you mouse over that where it says toolkit content first uh, and select all federally funded sites, we've gone ahead and crawled the entire federal government and mirrored all the textual content and built a relational database. And so um, what it should do, go ahead and uh, hit the uh, Oh, well, no, it's, it's done it. So if you see down below now, it's gone and it's sort of found information available in multiple sites across multiple agencies. It's found 3,800 documents. And, um, and so it's a way to cast a wider net. If you're not finding something that you think exists, but it's not currently immediately accessible in the toolkit, this is a way to cast a wider net across the entire federal government, including grantees like RISA's, or cooperative institutes, or uh, folks in academia, uh, the hubs, and that sort of thing. Um, and so that's just a high-level overview of the toolkit. Um, we plan to do a rigorous evaluation as well as stakeholder engagements through the course of this year. And then hopefully, if we can get funding in FY16, we will be able to take all the feedback we receive from the engagements and roll them up into a set of requirements uh, beginning in 16, which will help us begin to evolve the toolkit into the direction of sort of the quote-unquote ultimate deliverable that we envision. So there's a lot of ideas that we'd like to be able to do. It's just time and resources have prevented us from going as far and as fast as we'd like to, but on the other hand, we feel like we've come a long way, and there's plenty here to chew on now. And so, um, well, with that, um, I'd like to entertain any questions or comments you have. Okay, thank you, David. This is Victor. Um, anyone out there uh, have any thoughts or comments or questions at all for David? This is Steve Ammerton, Tulsa. Um, so with this toolkit, would is there actionable decision-making information that a person could obtain from this, say, to specifically, uh, should I sell my lakefront property and move, or should I stop growing a particular crop, or you know, sell that farm, or things like that? Is is that kind of information in here? No, <clears throat> no, it's not so specifically prescriptive. About the closest you'll find, for example, if you go into the topics page, uh, if you go, I'm sorry, in the topics section, and if you clicked on, for example, coastal flood risk. We tried to offer ways of thinking about a problem. So if you'll notice in the right-hand side where it says uh, you know, browse topics, and then under coastal flood risk in the right, there are the subtopics of that. And then the bottom most link in, under coastal flood risk where it says building resilience in coastal communities, if you select that, Victor, um, <clears throat> you'll see that we've provided some general information down below to what we're really trying to do is just help people think about the problem, help orient them. And so if you scroll down this page, you'll see some of the types of information that we offer. And we're working with the, the different section leads to try to identify information that will help people in grappling with the problem. Um, so we're not being very explicitly prescriptive in saying, you know, here, here exactly is what you should do. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a he works for Edward Jones Company. He's a mutual fund manager, and he was asking me about my job and what I do and, and what this is all about. And I said, well, you know, it's not so different than your job. Like if I were to ask you, what exactly should I buy? Which is the best stock or the best fund I should invest my money in, and how well is it going to do over the next five or ten years and, and all that? You wouldn't give me a straight answer. That's not why you're there. And he said, that's exactly right. I wouldn't tell you what to buy. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to help you think about 
you know, your strategy based on your values, based on, you know, where you are in your career trajectory, what's your tolerance for risk, and so forth. And so in many ways, that's kind of what we're trying to do here in the toolkit. If that answers your question. So, so the kit then doesn't really won't help somebody make a make a firm decision. Is that it? Um, well, no, I don't think so. I don't think I wouldn't entirely agree with that. We're not, you know in the federal government. I don't think we're here to tell people what to do, but I, I I do think we're here to try to help them make decisions and to make choices. Um, in any given decision that people face, as you know, outcomes are can be uncertain. It's not, and they have to weigh a lot of factors. What's the cost of acting? What's the cost of not acting? And so we're trying to help people deliberate, but ultimately we don't tell them what choice to make so much as we uh, help them move through that process. And that's kind of what the Get Started section is about, is sort of helping them to weigh all the various factors that are in play and how to think about it. And we're offering a bit of hand-holding along the way through the Find Experts section and through our engagements that I mentioned to try to help them orient. But at the end of the day, they're the ones who have to tee up the, uh, the decision that they face, and they're going to have to make that choice for themselves or based on their values, their tolerance for risk, and that sort of thing. Okay. So are there, are there uh, uh, sites that you can reach from here that will tell me what the expected, say, mean average rainfall will be for a particular area, uh, much like, I guess, how we have estimates of how high the, the sea level rise in different parts of the country. Are there things like that? Yeah, there are. There are tools like that in the, um, in the tools compendium. And um, we're actually, this year, we're, we're working on a new uh, tool to complement the Climate Explorer. We're calling it the Climate Widget. And it will be four specific locations and counties, and it will it will also show you um, the parameters, uh, what is normal versus what has uh, what is sort of the 30-year normal, quote unquote, as compared to what have the conditions been like in in recent history, and then what's the rate of change, and then we're looking to kind of splice in projection data what our climate projections suggesting will be happening in these parameters going forward in the future. So that's actually a development that's underway now. But for example, if you look at, in fact, uh, Victor has pointed his cursor right at one of the ones that I wanted to highlight called the Climate at a Glance, which is a very helpful tool um, that exists. It was developed by NC, formerly NCDC, now NCEI. And um, that's a good tool for um, we're getting at the type of question that you were asking, um, Steve. Uh, we're also working with, you may know, Fiona Horsefall um, and the local climate analysis tool. And we're, we're looking to incorporate that very prominently into the toolkit, which can help people visualize very specific climate-related information for decision making. So this one here might be useful to you. It helps you look at what is the rate of change for a given parameter at a given location over time. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to think how, you know, you might, how you would advise somebody or how they might use this information. And I, I suspect you realize, you know, we have, we're having a pretty serious drought in parts of Oklahoma, especially western Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Some of those lake levels are down pretty low yeah. uh, if, if there's much water left behind the dams. Right. Uh, the same thing, except we didn't have the dams, back in the 1950s occurred with a long-term drought, and, I mean, you know, CO2 levels were rising, temperatures were, you know, trending up and everything. It, it would seem that the advice back then might have been, you know, this, this is just going to continue and, and just get worse. But then the 60s through the early 2000s, there was plenty of rain. Lakes were built. They filled up and all that. I, I, I'm trying to, trying to figure out how you would advise somebody on something like that. You know, mm -hmm. if they're trying to make some kind of a long-term decision, yeah. And, but just, I mean, I don't trust my. When guy you say long-term decision, <laughs> when you say long-term decision, uh, what do you consider long-term? Are you thinking decades into the future, or are you thinking a year or two out? I'm thinking decades. I'm thinking uh -huh. pack up, you know, sell the farm, pack up, move somewhere where there's going to be rain. Um, yeah. 
some of these guys are just barely holding on, and they're trying okay. to figure right. it out. Uh, so, Victor, if you go into the uh, tools section um, of the toolkit, you might want to hit your back button. And um, there's a tool. Uh, go into the tools compendium there in the tools menu, and uh, we're going to uh, we're um, I think I may have mentioned we're going to be evolving. Yeah, so if you click on Browse Tools, we're going to be evolving the Climate Explorer a little bit to incorporate projections data. And um, have you have you clicked on that? Is it loading? And uh, filter by functionality in the upper right. We'll look at the projections tools. So where it says filter by functionality, um, down at the bottom where it says climate projections. So there, where your cursor is, climatedata.us. Click on that one. So this particular tool uses a, a downscaled model. Uh, if you go ahead and uh, down below where it says URL, you can click to launch the tool uh, in the right-hand margin of, towards the bottom of your page. Go ahead and uh, down there you go where it says URL. Click on that to launch that tool. So we're um, uh, go ahead and click the Get Started button. So this uses a NASA NEX uh, model uh, that's downscaled using the CMIP5 projections. Um, if you click on where it says Get Started, or maybe you did click on that, it's, uh, it's coming. Um, it will launch the viewer. So we're looking to evolve the climate projections data, I mean the, uh, the Climate Explorer. Uh, yeah, go ahead and click OK. To um, give this type of uh, visualization. So you can, um, down below, there's a temporal slider uh, where it says 2010 down below. So if you were, say, the person that Steve mentioned is looking to make a several decades into the future. So if you pick a couple, like the year 2030, and then you can swipe from left to right, uh, low emissions versus a high emissions scenario. Um, and you can kind of compare, you know, what might the future look like at that span of time uh, in, in looking at temperature. Um, and you can also, uh, in the top of the screen, where it's, uh, instead of temperature, you can click on precip uh, to, to do some sort of a comparison. And this is sort of a, of a long term or an annual average. So um, one way of l utilizing the, um, the, the projections data is we're, we're going to be meeting with this theme team I mentioned to try to get at what is the actionable information in projections. And we recognize that people are always going to want it to be location specific. They want to know about their farm or their watershed or their county and that type of thing. And so that's part of the rub is just figuring out what's an effective way to make available these data and how you know, have them interactive. And so you can zoom in here in this map, and it will resolve to being fairly high resolution. And so uh, that's something that we're going to be working on over the course of this year, is how to make available information for those types of choices that people face. You know, what, are, what do the data say? Uh, what are the observations? But again, whether to sell the farm or not, whether to plant a specific type of crop or not, that's not a decision that we're going to be able to tell them or that the federal government, that's one that they're going to have to sort of own and make for themselves based on what the data have to, what the data show. But I just wanted you, what we're trying to do is get the information there online in a sort of an easily accessible way and then build in entree where there are opportunities for people to connect to experts who can help them navigate those types of choices, understand uncertainty, and grapple with uh, the ranges of uncertainty and sort of helping them arrive at some sort of a decision point. So it's, it's kind of not possible to anticipate all questions anyone anywhere might have and then have pre-produced information that answers that question. So we're sort of doing the best we can to get information to the surface and accessible but also building in that vector that allows them to access experts who can do the hand-holding from there. Well, if I can ask, ask you something else, you, and you mentioned it there, to show these people what the data indicate. Yes. And, and you have it on the chart there about the data. Mm -hmm. this, this is, in fact, isn't really data, is it? It's, it's projection. It's a model output. 
its model output. Is that yep. something we need to make clear to people? Absolutely. Not data. Is that Absolutely. Right? Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, any other, any questions? other questions at all? <clears throat> okay. Um, any last round for any questions at all? David, this is Victor. Like I said, I think, you know, I, you first showed this to us perhaps about a year ago or so, and then I think at that, that point in time it was pretty uh, heavy on sea level rise and uh, things along those lines. It, it, it's improved by light years, and I, I really do think it's a great tool for, you know, whether you're a government entity to use or, you know, like weather forecast office on RFC or with something to refer your customers to or refer users to. Mm -hmm. um, I think it definitely, you know, fills that niche or fills that need. Thank um, you, Victor. Any, any, any next steps, to, uh, David? I mean, you mentioned a couple. What do you say within the next six months? Uh, what are the maybe six to twelve months for the next two or three things that you envision uh, being added? Yeah, thank you. We're going to continue fleshing out the topic sections, as I mentioned. Uh, we're going to be adding a water section to the Climate Explorer. We're going to be adding more map layers into the Explorer, showing more uh, different types of climate-related stressors. Um, in a couple of weeks, we're going to engage an interagency theme team of modeling experts to begin to think about the incorporation. So this is a tool that we link to. This is not our tool, the one that you're showing right now. Uh, it's one of like 11 or 12 different tools that are out there. Um, we're going to be looking, though, to evolve the, uh, the Climate Explorer and the functionality and the capabilities of the Explorer uh, to try to start to move in the direction that the previous questioner was asking about, which is how can I extract actionable information from what you're showing me? Um, and to refine the functionality in the ways that would allow people to show trends over time and what's the rate of change and to define extreme thresholds and how many times is that threshold being exceeded and is, it, is that changing over time. So um, we're also, I mentioned the engagements. We are spinning up a number of engagements with businesses and communities and just really starting in their domain and then working backwards into the toolkit from there. Um, to say, you know, what what are the issues that you face? What are your motivations or your objectives? And then once we understand that, then we can think about, well, what do we have in the toolkit that's relevant and useful to them? And do we need to then work with them very specifically to build their skill and capacity in using that tool in whatever is the circumstance that they're working with? And so it's it's very tailored that way. So what we, we can do, you know, in interactive engagements, perhaps what we couldn't do uh, you know, in a pre-generated website, but that allows us to to be very flexible that way. So um, those those are a few things that's coming. Thank you, David. Thank you. Um, like I said, maybe you know, a year or so from now, we can have you know do another webinar like this for weather forecast offices. Um, if anyone, uh, we're getting sort of short on time here. I would really like to wrap this thing up by two o'clock for for David's sake, and I guess for everyone else's sake that has to attend that uh, hazard simplification webinar. Um, if anyone has any suggestions or tips for improvements or changes or products I'd like to see on the thing, feel free to just shoot me an email. I'll send it to David, um, or I'll send it to David at NOAA.gov. Uh, either way, I'm sure David would like to hear from us. Sure. And, um, David, if you're, if you're willing, maybe in a year from now when you've made the additional changes and modifications, we can do this again. Um, I think it's a great tool. Um, like I said, I think from a WFO perspective, you know, you all get a lot of questions I know. Time is scarce and limited. A lot of times it's not possible to research or dredge up every single conceivable answer or possibility. And a lot of times you just have to refer people or refer customers to, uh, you know, websites like this uh, for them to flesh out their answers. Like David said, to help them make their decisions. I don't think we want to make decisions for them on, you know, what they should do with their piece of land 10, 20 years from now, but um, uh, informing these people to help them with their own decisions, and if you will, you know, climate decision support, I think is uh, where it's at. So if there's any last, any last rounders at all. Okay, nothing heard. David, thank you very much for doing this. And, uh, Victor, it's been my uh, pleasure. I'll be, I'll be thank able, you. I'll, I'll be in touch with you. <laughs> okay, it's been my pleasure. Thank you very much. And, and I'd be delighted to come back say, in a year. 
Thanks, David. For everyone else to say, sorry about the technical snafus. No worries. Bye-bye. Thank you, David. Thank you, Victor.